You know our friends at Wicking Vicar for their comfortable clerical shirts and their wooden Advent wreath playset. They're back with a new gift, and this time it's for the Lutheran ladies. Introducing their beautiful necklace featuring 14 karat gold filled charms of the cross and Luther seal, a simple and feminine way to express your faith every day. This necklace arrives in a gift box and is perfect for confirmation, graduation, Mother's Day, or First Communion. Visit wickingvicar.com to find this necklace and other gifts. That's W I C K I N G V I C A R.com. Listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. We have a fun episode ahead of us. And imagine we're all sitting around a kitchen table having a lovely discussion about something theological, and a pastor just happens to walk in. That's what we're doing today. But we realized we've done a couple of these kitchen table talk episodes that we've been having a lot of fun, but we haven't really explained why we're doing these episodes. So Rachel, help us understand this. <laughs> <laughs> well, totally on the spot, Sarah, because I did not prepare for this at all. <laughs> but the Kitchen Table Talk series is for those questions that we feel are a little above our pay grade as theologians. Now, not that women do not make wonderful kitchen table theologians, but we acknowledge and cherish our pastors. And when we have the opportunity to have one sit down with us, well, let's just say we maybe keep a running list of things we want to talk to our beloved pastor in residence about mm. whenever he stops by. And so uh, some of these prompts on this list of possible questions come from conversations in our Facebook group that, you know, that not all of our Facebook conversations are in any way theological, but sometimes they are theological and sometimes they are kind of thorny theological questions. And so we tend to save those up and, uh, you know, bring them out for special occasions, like when our friend Chaplain Sean Denzer stops by the Lutheran Ladies Lounge to join us for one of these conversations. So we are thrilled to have him in studio today. It's great to be and back, guys. Help us. I mean, guys, in the you know, Michigan sense <laughs> yes. of the term, as you probably discussed right, yeah. before. I'm yeah. offended right now, Chaplain. Do what you can, bro. Gender new. It's original gender neutral term. Mm. Yeah. For real. <laughs> yes. So today we thought we would just throw out a gigantic softball for you that may or may not actually be a softball. <laughs> True. <laughs> in light of uh, some interesting things that have happened in our synod lately and a controversy that we will not touch with a 10-foot pole today, we're going to talk about the large catechism because all of this that has recently happened made us all go, hmm, there's a large catechism, and people are now <laughs> discovering that we have one. So maybe we should talk about why we should be reading this. <laughs> well, it makes it, it always makes it easier to comment on when you haven't read it. So, <laughs> but, but oh, I, no, we know it. <laughs> it a five foot pole, fifteen foot. Yeah, uh, I think you're you're right that you know this is a. It's sort of for me just touching it with a three foot pole, I guess. It surprised me that there was a controversy over the large catechism in our church this spring, given that I know how few of y'all out there have actually read the thing cover to cover, including me. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a time that the, the question that needed to be asked first was the one we're going to be talking about today, before we talk about any controversies. The question that needs to be asked is, what is the large catechism and why should we read it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that definitely has been overshadowed in the controversy. And also just like at the most surface level on this, it could be important, especially if you heard the story this way, like, you know, Lutherans make a new large catechism with all mm -hmm. sorts of problems within it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. It's a huge distinction. I, to do this. I always wanted to do it like for real, kind of like that one movie. I forget the name now. Um, Dead Poet Society, right? Where you rip out pages of the yep. book. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you know, show me, hold up your small catechism for catechism class and show me, you know, what part is the small catechism and rip out all that explanation in the back. And then once you're done with that, you have like this, the two flaps and a t 40 pages is all. And then it's you can a pamphlet. rip out. 
on mm-hmm. every single page all of Luther's stuff too and get to the to the heart of it, which is really the commandments, the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Bible verses about the sacraments. Uh, you know, that's, that's what the catechism really is, is those six things. Uh, one pastor had put it this way to me once, I, and I love it. It's, it's a joke, of course, but we only <laughs> believe six things. It's not hard. <laughs> Lutheranism is not hard. Six things, that's mm. it. <laughs> One more the finger. New slogan yeah. for Lutheranism: It's not mm-hmm. hard. It's not hard. It's <laughs> six things. Uh, yeah, but obviously we're not minimalists about it. You can go in to to all sorts of depth on it, right? And I mean. One of the great quotes from the large catechism from Luther's own mouth is, you know, if you had the Ten Commandments, you know those really well, you really would know the whole Bible. He's kind of daring you to do it, right? To say, how can I like kind of, I hate this phrase, but right, unpack the Ten (laughs) Commandments so that you like find the whole Bible connected to it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Find everything that we believe connected to it. And, And I think you can do that with the six parts of the catechism if you want to. Uh, so in a way, we kind of you know can think of these like nesting dolls. You got everybody ought to know it by some age. Ten commandments by heart. You could just rattle those off. You know the creed we say it all the time. Uh, Lord's prayer we say it multiple times a day. So you ought to know those texts. I, I think everybody needs to know the words of institution. It's nice if your church sings them because you kind of get that one for free. Mm. Uh, uh, but mm-hmm. but you. You don't just learn it because we want to have some memory work and you want to like do a parlor trick for somebody. You like you can call it to memory and mm-hmm. and you ought to be able to say, okay, if I get really lost, which happens to me all the time, <laughs> let's just go back to the like, okay, Jesus said, This is my body, this is my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Can I with that touchstone, can I explain clearly what I'm trying to say about the Lord's Supper? Or can I um, find out where actually I've said something mistaken because, well, it doesn't agree with his own words, so I better make sure that matches, right? Mm -hmm. And and then you can write sermons on it. Guess what? Your pastor, I hope, will preach about the Lord's Supper more than once in your lifetime. And and that really brings us then to what the catechisms are, right? So the small catechism, Luther takes those six things and gives very brief explanation to them with the idea of like, here's, you know, the basic kids version or like touchstone explanation of it all. But the large catechism is kind of like a longer sermon on each part. In fact, that's how it started. So he (laughs) preached a bunch of sermons on the Ten Commandments. He got them published a couple years later. Uh, He preached one on the Creed. He preached one on the Lord's Prayer. Then he combined those in 1520. And then, you know, by the time 1529 comes along, he actually releases his small catechism and this what he calls the large catechism, which is really sermons that have kind of been tweaked and, you know, hmm. edited. Thank goodness, made a little shorter, maybe. And, uh, <laughs> and, and made something that's like a handy book that you can read through that has a little bit of logic to it and is a little less for the hearing and a little more for the reading and the coming back to. That's what the catechisms are, uh, you know, and uh, and that has not changed, even, you know, touch the controversy again, That has not changed. We're not updating it for our times. We're not updating it for new opinions. We're not letting these things creep into that. Uh, It's just some other attending essays. Some other sermons, you might say, that have been added along with Luther's. And, uh, you know, those things are always worth as much as they're worth. Not every one of my sermons has been published. Can you believe that? What? Hmm. (laughs) I wouldn't expect many of my sermons will be published. I mean, there have been a lot of pastors over the years, you know, 2,000 of them. And very few of them have ever been published. It's probably fine. You know, Mm. most of them were given to this group of people. God is a lot more personable than we are. We would probably be like, why don't we just write the definitive, you know, whatever topic it is. Here's the definitive answer. Good. Print that puppy. We're done. (laughs) Uh, You know, next next problem. Mm. Uh, Instead, the Lord Taylor makes pastors for everybody, gives, gives you a pastor, your congregation has called has somebody called just to them to deliver a word of God to shape your congregation throughout the whole week. Uh, and he doesn't just download his sermons offline and, uh, and <laughs> preach them to you like the guy next door. Hmm. Um, so No, no, no artificial intelligence right. involved? Well, who knows <gasps> anymore, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, so not all those get written down, you know. 
it's Paul, right, who says this, right? That that on on the foundation of Christ are going to be built. You know, everybody's doing their building. Some people are building with hay. Some people are building with wood. Some people are building with gold and silver, right? Not all that stuff lasts when the fire and the in the water comes along, right? Mm. Some of it built is built better and lasts longer. And every man has different mm. gifts and strengths, and uh, and that's all right. But, you know, I, I would say the catechism is, you know, if the scriptures are the gold, then the catechism we think is like the silver, and then, you know, you can build out from there. So, hmm. so well, actually, no, I want to circle back because I made, you made me think of it when you were describing this. So the LCMS, we've got, we've got our small catechism, we've got our large catechism. Do other Lutheran church bodies have different versions that have done more? adjusting for the times as they see it, uh, shall we say? Yeah. You know, so there's a way in which, okay, Lutherans believe the scriptures are God's own word, so we generally don't change them. In fact, even the churches that don't necessarily believe it's God's own word still seem to afford it some kind of, I mean, they're not actually just going around changing the Bible and crossing right. things out. Right. So, that, so there's some kind of reverence. Maybe uh, humanly speaking, there's a reverence there. We're just not going to mess with that, right? Uh, okay. I think it, it's interesting. I think in church bodies that aren't the Missouri Synod, that don't mm-hmm. have a, as high a view of the scriptures as we do, they are even more reverential to Luther. Huh. I mean, I think I, I think some church bodies okay. believe Luther more than the Bible. If I could say that, they seem to hmm. really. That's the thing that holds their church together is Luther, and you know, I think we'd be a pains to say, yes, we love Luther. He's the chief teacher of our confession. Uh, what he said is good because the Bible says it's good. Like mm-hmm. we're not, we don't actually mm-hmm. think he's giving new insights. He's just restoring old insights that were there in the scriptures. Um, he just happened to be the right man for the right time, and. Uh, we thank God for him. God raised him up, obviously, for this purpose. Uh, but uh, I think others are, are almost more reverential to Luther's words. And I think they tend, as, re- as a result, not to change them. You know, everybody's translation might be different. You know, it's trespasses here, it's sins there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, you know, witchcraft or satanic arts or, you know, however the our small catechism translations have changed over the years. Mm. I think all of them are still more or less in the realm of faithful translations to what he said. But the explanations added on to Luther's, those are different in every church body. I mean, so we've had a number of updates. This is a long-standing Missouri Synod tradition to take those Veit Dietrich explanations, which are kind of like the, the you know, the 100 and 400 questions that are at the back of your catechism that usually have Bible verses along with them. Those are other pastors' works, and Schwann added some. He was one of the uh, pastors in the Missouri Synod. We had the revision in the 80s and the blue one. I remember <laughs> that one before there was the dark blue in 1940s. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then we had the brand new one that was a number of years ago I think people already forgot about. Uh, they did a lot of changing. Some people were grumpy. They thought it, you know the reading level was too high now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, So likewise, there are lots of catechism programs or catechism explanations in other church bodies you know, that probably reflect the direction their church goes. But but I would say, you know, like I can think of one in particular from uh, ELCA group uh, by James Nestigan and Gerhard Ferdy. It's called Free to Be, and it's kind of their catechism that they wrote. They still have Luther's explanations in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, the translation's different than ours, but it's faithful, mm-hmm. you know. But then in their explanations of things, it changes a little bit. Like, you know, hmm. they say about atonement, well, don't worry about what the sacrifice means. Uh, uh, we don't want to ask too many questions here because we don't want to talk about it either. Uh, you know, so they're yeah. downplaying that. It's not an interest to them. Uh, for us, you know, we think. But they still have the phrase purchased and won, not with gold or silver, but mm. with this holy precious blood. So, hmm. like, they're, they're sidestepping the words that they still let stay there. I think that's... That's good, and if it, if if that's a hard sell, that's fine. Actually, that's that's what the Heidelberg Catechism has in it on the Lord's Supper, right? It's got all these wonderful things like, uh, then why did Jesus say, if it's only a symbol of his body and blood, then why does Jesus say, this is my body? Answer, well, for good reason, Jesus said, this is my body, blah, 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 you know. You know <laughs> and of course, the Heidelberg that, Catechism is not a Lutheran Catechism. No, it is not. No, it is not. <laughs> no. It's a Reformed Catechism. So don't go out there, you catechism completists, and buy yourself a Heidelberg because Chaplain Denzer mentioned it yes, on you air. You heard it. Don't clip it. Yeah, you heard it here first. Don't clip me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
all right. Obviously, the small catechism is, you know, a gift and it's something that all confirmands should be exposed to and memorize parts of. And I am currently going through it for the fourth time with my third child. So once through my own confirmation and then now I'm on child number three, who's just finishing her first year of catechism. So I get to go back through the the small catechism on a somewhat regular basis. And it really is a wonderful text to sort of enhance the way I read scripture. But as I think I hinted at the beginning of the episode, I have never gone further into the large catechism. Well, I started the preface once. And then Luther said something about starving your children. And I just sort of tuned out and never came back around to it. So, you know, my reading is mostly, as I think Luther would approve of, straight out of scripture when I'm doing my devotional reading. But my question for you and the thing that this whole conversation about the large catechism sort of sparked in me is this question, am I missing out by just sticking with scripture and the small catechism? Should I take the time at the age of 42 to go back and read the large catechism? And if so, why? I, like, what do I get more that isn't, <laughs> sure. that isn't available through those sources? I mean, again, I think with the, there's, a, there's an error in the side of you've got to know everything. I, I've, mm. I've been trying. That's very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> we like to do that in the Lutheran Church. <laughs> oh, we like to know to things. Know everything. Uh, <laughs> Also, minimalism, kind of this idea like, well, what's good enough? You know, that never, your mom was not happy about that. <laughs> Neither was your teacher. Uh, so, you know, there's a way in which people are like, well, you know, is the small catechism enough? Good. I've got it. I'm not going to do any more. Check that box. Yeah. Mm. This is the point of if the goal is to grow in faith and grow in love for our neighbors and, and grow in understanding and appreciation and delight and you know, if you ever want Christianity to come naturally to you instead of just kind of like having to remind yourself, oh, I guess it's Sunday, I should go to church, or oh, I suppose I shouldn't be a jerk today. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't come naturally to you if you're not involved in it. <laughs> Signed by your door, you're heading out. <laughs> Don't be a jerk today. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> I mean, this is the amazing thing about being a disciple of Jesus, right, is most people, like most teacher-student relationships, your goal is to graduate and get the heck out of there and you don't have to listen to that guy anymore, you know, or mm. uh, I become the master now. With Jesus, it's the opposite. Like the more we learn from him, the more we grow in him, the more we need him, the more we, mm. we just sang uh, an Easter hymn, right? I will cling to him forever yeah. now. Uh, you know, uh, his disciples grow into him and uh, and don't grow out of him. So that's why I think it makes sense that if you started in a small way, it's a small catechism, why not carry on to something larger, right? Why not go to church another year and see if you can learn something more from those same scriptures again, right? Why not read the Christmas story or the Easter story for the thousandth time mm. and still enjoy it? And in fact, still notice something you never, a facet you never had before, right? Mm -hmm. So that's there too. And just, I mean, the, the wonderful thing that we do here, right, is we find out that you, uh, intelligent, wise, smart Christians, still have questions and things that mm -hmm. you're pondering yet again. Mm -hmm. And you might even want to seek other Christians to hear th what they've learned about it and have them lead you through the scriptures or have them present it to you and, uh, and, and hear that back. We do this all the time with each other. This is one way it's been written down, happens to be by a guy we're interested in as Lutherans, Martin Luther. So, <laughs> and I particularly, look, I just think, I usually read it out of, uh, there is the new edition you can use. I usually read out of my Book of Concord, one of my uh, Concordia. I've got the reader's edition here. Uh, it's got pictures. Love it. Yes. Mm. How many pages is the large catechism? How big of a commitment oh, gonna, is it? I was going to look this up. Uh, let's see. Starts have, on 351 here. I have the little version of it. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Yeah. The, the small the, like, version the just, of the large catechism. Just the large catechism paperback with study questions is 157 pages. Okay, so that's not as large. Right, as so I think 
a lot of us... That looks about the size of the small catechism with explanation, quite honestly. I think, and maybe I shouldn't say a lot of us, maybe I should say me and other people might think like me. Like, we think large catechism where we're like, oh my goodness, it's going to be so long. I think I've been picturing (laughs) the Book of Concord as like large catechism and... It's really not anyway, that long. Yeah. And the pictures yeah. take a. Uh, did I mention the pictures? Yeah, <laughs> the pictures are really cool. <laughs> the pictures in it. Oh, it's a hundred. So it is in the name. It does say that it's large. Yeah, yeah, it's, so oh, yeah. that yeah. could be intimidating. Right. But it's it's large for a catechism. Uh-huh. Okay. But that's not large okay. for a book. It's really uh-huh. not. Go for the Latin. This is the major one, okay? Mm. But there's the minor. Oh, catechism. This is the major, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just rename everything. Catechism <laughs> Supreme. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Supreme. Pizza. What do you get from the large catechism that you don't get from the small catechism? Oh, you get to you get to hear Luther preach. And that was what I was gonna say is uh I I I like the confessions. I even like the boring, solid declaration, like, you know, <laughs> let's talk philosophy, weird stuff. Mm. But Luther's the best. I mean, the small cold's even better because he thinks he's dying. He's got a kidney stone this whole time. So oh. he's sassy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, and, uh, we like sassy you theologians. Get, you get a little sass in here too. And uh, uh-huh. I mean, Luther is lively. Okay, yes, we don't talk about – not all of us have uh, handmaidens and oxes and donkeys anymore like Luther mm. might have run into. Uh, and we're not afraid of poltergeists as much as he is. Uh, but at the same time – Man, Luther is lively, and there's mm. a way in which, you know, when he talks about raising kids, when he talks about how you deal with merchants, uh, and certainly when he talks about the scriptures, it pops off the page. It talks to me quite well today, you know, mm. as long as I'm not offended to hear that there were people living in times without iPhones. Uh, <laughs> I, I find Luther to be very lively uh, yeah. and exciting. And certainly in the prefaces, he is because he's just mad. He's just ticked off at how lazy the pastors are, not to mention the people. And uh, and so he takes it out on those pastors. I mean, I think that's helpful, again, to see is that the catechisms are written, yes, ultimately for teaching the common person, you might say. But in a way, they're almost entirely addressed to the pastors because it's kind of like you guys are morons. If you can do nothing better, why don't you just sit there and read this? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. actually, I want to say that's that's kind of what I think the large – that's where I would like to see the large catechism have its place in our Lutheran life is as a father's reading, they call this. So, uh, look, not every service has a pastor present. Like if you're doing matins at home, your pastor doesn't always pop into the kitchen table. And it's not as if you have a group of Christians that don't have a pastor present. They like can't have church or can't pray together or sing hymns. You know, but we don't all get up and preach our own sermons. Uh, mm. But there's a long tradition, especially in the monasteries. We don't have those anymore. But uh, of reading somebody else's sermon. That, I mean, it was mm. a good sermon. Maybe this is one that was good enough to write down. Let's read it again. Mm. And and the small cat or the large catechism is kind of that directly. I think it's since it's part of our confession, since it's 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 building on what we already all know. In the small catechism, this is kind of the great place to start for, okay, I want to have like a reading outside the Bible, in addition to the Bible, complementary to the Bible, uh, that I could read with my friends, with my family. Uh, you can read whatever you want if you're on your own, right? That's the benefit of, of not having a family. But if you've got to organize something for your household, uh, if you're ahead of the household or if you're the only one who's there and you got to get everybody to be quiet or if it's bedtime or, or we're gathering, you know, pastor – fell off his roof and he's in the hospital this Sunday mm-hmm. and the elder gets up and has to lead matins or something. I think this is the ideal thing to read. Mm. Uh, and uh, and it, it leads you systematically through the six parts, the th- six things we believe. And, uh, and it has some liveliness. It goes into some depth, but not too much depth. And and it mm-hmm. takes its time doing it. So, so I think that's what really recommends it for that kind of, you know, place in your life. Mm-hmm. I think there's some quotes, too, that kind of roam around the Internet or that we know of from Luther that actually come from the large catechism, too. And I I, I don't remember when I did it, but I did a series for KFUO social media, I don't know, a few years ago from the large catechism. It's mm. Let me tell you, it is hard to pick a single like sentence quote from each of these parts because Luther just keeps going and going and it's like a whole paragraph. But I know one of them, the um, what is this in? Sacrament of the Altar? 
talking about the devil. Now, what is the devil? Nothing other than what the scripture call him, a liar and a murderer. He was a liar to lead the heart astray from God's word and to blind it so that you cannot feel your distress or come to Christ. He is a murderer who cannot bear to see you live one single hour. If you could see how many knives, darts, and arrows are at every moment aimed at you, you would be glad to come to the sacrament as often as possible. But there is also no reason why we walk about so securely and carelessly except that we neither think nor believe that we are in the flesh and in this wicked world or in the devil's kingdom. I didn't like, before I found that in here, I didn't realize that quote was from a large catechism about all the knives and darts and things mm. pointed at you. Like there's pictures, people have done illustrations of that too. It's interesting. You can hear in that part of the small catechism that maybe Luther didn't write, right? The 20 questions, I call them. Mm. Oh. The Christian questions are answers. I love those. Which... It says these are written by Luther, and then there's a note in the in the hymnal, at least, right? They might not have been written by Luther. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Burst my bubble, man. Everything you thought you learned was wrong. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know what's true anymore. I'm but, just kidding. But, <laughs> I mean, it's exactly what he, right? He asks, like, he does that whole thing about grab your chest, see if mm-hmm. you're still a uh, human, then yep. you know what the Bible says about your flesh. Uh, mm-hmm. Look, if you're still in this world, then look at what the Bible says about what the world will be after you and know that the devil's going to be attacking you. I mean, it's exactly what he says hmm. in a brief way, what he says in a longer way here, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, th- th- that's great. Why is Twitter not the greatest form of communication? <laughs> Because sometimes you want to have three examples instead mm. of one, and I don't want to have to follow your thread or whatever, right? <laughs> and uh, and sometimes you want to ponder it for a little while, right? Sometimes you want the pastor to shut up because you want to think about what he said in the previous sentence, and he never gives you that chance. Too bad. Mm. <laughs> uh, but other times you want somebody else to do the thing that you're going to follow with them, right? You're going to mm. track with their words as they kind of draw this thought out. I think that's that's what the large category is catechism is for the small catechism right it's Mm. of course it's more words it's more verbose uh but it's uh it's meditating and thinking and and talking out kind of the conclusions that can be drawn from the more pithy things like uh i believe that i cannot believe Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and i i think one benefit of having luther do this like you refer to it as sermons but these are not sermons in the sense that we would think of them today, you know, where there's a heartwarming story and a little takeaway and, a, you know, a gospel, a bold gospel declaration. and But it, it's calculated to stir as many hearts as possible without offending anybody. Whereas Luther, and maybe I've just misrepresented preaching in the Christian church today very badly, but, but Luther, he doesn't beat around the bush. And he doesn't, even even though these are more verbose than the small catechism, just glancing through them, I can see that they're still very tightly constructed, mm-hmm. that he doesn't waste words, he doesn't mince words, and he's just going to tell you like it is, but he's going to go into the necessary detail to draw out all the meanings he can from it. And so, you know, it is, it's a Luther sermon, which is maybe different than a sermon like we might hear in some of our churches today. You're delving into kind of a hot topic among pastors right now, I think, which is, <laughs> this is good news, trust me, thinking about what okay. we are preaching and maybe trying to improve it. Oh, You could benefit from this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to hear that we're trying. Um, but but among the topics of discussion is, is what is the place of teaching in a sermon? Hmm. And I think you're right, in the, in the early 90s, Uh, There was not much room for teaching because the important part was stories. Mm. Not our best moment. A little bit later, though, and certainly the time I was in seminary, I think the the focus was much more on calling to repentance, uh, cutting to the heart with the law, and uh, absolving and uh, salving with the comforting gospel. I mean, again, also good, uh, but probably to the exclusion of teaching, that all stays in Bible class. Mm. Uh, Mm. Some pastors even just come out and say that I do the heavy lifting in Bible class that's by design right and uh, and preaching is about proclaiming the gospel and that kind of for the effect of the gospel which again there's nothing wrong with that I think we absolutely see that at Pentecost uh, but a lot of the church's history is teaching this stuff right explaining what it means and what would that look like for as an example and uh, and that's certainly the way sermons have often been in the Lutheran church just not in our kind of living memory so I think our pastors are starting to realize, well, it is interesting that my sermon sounds nothing like Luther's preaching. Hmm. I wonder if that is 
wonder if I should reconsider that. So, hmm. so things may change. The hard part is that makes it longer, right? But uh, a service longer than an hour? What? Yeah. Sorry, that's a soapbox of mine. I mean, but <laughs> Moving it, you on. know, you guys would dare to entertain a pastor at your kitchen table, right? Shows that. It is great when that happens because we all betray. Actually, I really do want more than an hour. I want to. Mm-hmm. I want to delve a little mm-hmm. deeper, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, it, it's it's totally fine, and it's what pastors do to go one on one to everybody. But it would be great if we all got together in the same room and did that at the same time. Just be very efficient. And oh, mm-hmm. that's preaching. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So eventually, after we've ruined everything and blown it up and tried our new things, we come back to the old things. So. All right, so we, we want to talk about the actual text of this a little yeah. bit? Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. I don't know, what, if you have things you want to pull out, you can, but we'll start, I think, with the prefaces. There's two prefaces. He had one in 29 when he first did it, and then one in 30. Uh, he has a long and a short Yeah, one. walk us through this, because I think I already admitted I've not read the thing. Yeah, so the first I one's, know. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one's more sassy. They're both pretty <laughs> sassy. Yeah, I think the first one, he's calling everybody pigs and dogs and all this, right? Um <laughs> Dealing with this trouble of it seems like, okay, we had the Reformation, right? We, we saved the day. Everything's good. The gospel's reigning again, right? Mm. But people seem to interpret it as, great, we don't have to go to church anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, no. That was the wrong lesson. <laughs> great. We're, uh, Jesus forgives our sins. We don't have to be afraid of going to hell so we could do whatever we want. <laughs> Uh, and no. <laughs> so Luther, you know, Luther's trying to address that part partially in here, but also, you know, that that means the pastors have to teach something. That means they have to explain the teaching uh, much more clearer. Uh, he kind of uh, foreshadows something that later Urbanus Regius, one of my favorite friend, uh, guys, uh, uh, kind of a second generation Lutheran reformer up in the north. He actually met Luther on his way up north. He wrote this nice little book called formulas and ways of speaking cautiously for pastors to kind of, it'd be like the perfect new seminarian uh, going out into the ministry gift. It's basically like, uh, kind of don't be a jerk for pastors, yeah? <laughs> like, oh. you could say things like, the mass is evil and uh, it's it's, a, it's the devil and we should just never do it. Mm. But then, nobody's going to go to church, you moron, so <laughs> why don't you speak a little more carefully and a little more circumspectly and, you know, yeah. yeah. Explain yourself a little better, and maybe they would understand what you're actually trying to say. Maybe don't speak in tweets and sound bites exclusively. Mm. Honestly, like there's a place for edginess, but uh, eventually you kind of just want a nuanced answer here and there. It doesn't mean you're being a wimp all the time. Mm. So, if you're all edges, you're just a knife. Ah, not fun. <laughs> we thing. want to. <laughs> Sometimes you want some bread (laughs) instead of a knife. (laughs) Going off the rails. That's good. (laughs) So the the long preface, he says this, which I think is great, kind of an answer again to Rachel's question, right? Uh, This is right near the end. Therefore, again, I beg all Christians, but especially those pastors and preachers, not to think of themselves as doctors too soon and imagine they know everything. Mm. Instead, they should daily exercise themselves well in these studies and constantly use them. Furthermore, they should guard with all care and diligence against the poisonous infection of contentment and vain imagination, but steadily keep on reading, teaching, learning, pondering, and meditating on the catechism. And they shouldn't stop until they've tested uh, and are sure that they've taught the devil to death and have become more learned than God himself and all his saints. There's oh, tongues dear. in cheek there, right? AKA, ah. don't stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I mean, so you it, won't. <laughs> so it does. It does put it in the realm of like exercise, eating, mm, uh, drinking mm-hmm. your morning coffee, <laughs> right? These these things in life. So so it's not so much that um, it's not just information download, or it's not just mm. I transferred this number off the page into my phone, so I know I've got it, and now I'll forget it. Mm. But it's I'm gonna just keep rehearsing this. I'm gonna. It's going to be a daily routine. It's going to get kind of the secondary benefits of a routine, but it's also going to have knowledge. You know, every once in a while, I'll take a moment to say, huh, you know, I never thought about that. You know, actually, this is a good way to do this. Or I imagine if you exercise, which I don't, uh, (laughs) I imagine eventually you'd be like, you know what? 
I should move my hand this way instead of the way I've been doing it because it hurts me that way. And this is better, <laughs> right? And then you slowly get some benefit out of that. Uh, well, in the same way, then do that with the with the word of God and with the teachings of God. Hmm. That's an interesting thing because uh, especially now with like the internet, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't know. Somebody asks a question and I'm like, I'm just going to look it up. So like mm-hmm. I know where to find a mm-hmm. lot of information mm-hmm. so I don't actually have to commit things to memory or like make sure that I know stuff by heart. But theology, like this is different. Like this is something you actually do want to know and be able to access in your brain and not on a phone somewhere. Is that true? I Like, is she, are you right? Am I right? <laughs> like why? So that's a huge difference between Luther's time and our time, right? They need preaching because people can't read on their own. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Even this book, probably not that many people could read it, right? So they'd have to memorize the small catechism. Somebody who knows how to read would have to read this large thing to me. Probably easier to just go to church and hear the, the pastor who's there for that. Um, you know, but now we do have the ability to just, we can find anything when we need it and ignore it when we don't. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're daring to say that we actually still have to do it the old fashioned way for this. Is that right? I think it We're is. All right. Right. <laughs> No, I am not worried at all. You, it is right. It is right. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Mm. Like, when it comes to the things of God, we can't just say, oh, I can Google that anytime I want. Like, we get to carry it around inside us because, you know, I, and my my older children are currently studying World War II and, you know, reading The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. And it's a reminder to me mm. that we can't take it for granted. What you, If you don't have it crammed into your brain, you might not get to maintain access to it. Sorry. I like, you, I like you, the conspiracy theory tech. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never know when the Internet's going to shut down mm-hmm. and then I won't be able to right. do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has happened before. Yeah, it could be held hostage, like uh, mm. the whole you, world yes. until recently. <laughs> mm. Sorry, well, you goaded me into it. No, no. I, I, so I, I think the conspiracy theory part is great, mm. but I also think just the idea of internalizing and make it natural, right? Like I, I've heard that golfers practice their swing all the time and you just try and get that like so it's second nature right Mm -hmm. so even the practicing is trying to aim not that it would be like i am consciously thinking of every muscle fiber as i do this thing but that i will become so natural at it that it will just flow out of me Mm -hmm. you know i'm sure there's a music analogy and everything else too but the i was gonna say it it reminds me of practicing music just because you can play doesn't mean you don't practice and just because you have the music in front of me doesn't it doesn't mean that your fingers don't also your fingers and ears don't also have it memorized that they all work together and it's something that is internal to you yeah it's a different kind of learning than just absorbing facts mm. and even if the world doesn't end and we need to like rewrite the catechism in the bible from memory which <laughs> would be embarrassing how Poorly, we could do that, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be fun, Lutheran Ladies' Lounge, right? Let's write oh. the Bible. Oh, dear. Let's see how much of the Bible the five of us could come up with. I think we would fail at that wow. task. I feel like we a pack a lot of the gist. We could get the gist. <laughs> we could get the important stuff. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. I, got the, I, I got the 23rd Psalm, mostly. And like most of John chapter 1. So you can take Working your time on to Romans eight. about that later, right? <laughs> thanks, but, uh, thanks. I feel <laughs> terrible about myself now. <laughs> My job is done here. <laughs> oh, okay, but more importantly, like again, with that flowing naturally off us, right? If we ever want to share this, if we ever want to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that's in us, if we mm-hmm. want to be able to talk to our friends, or like, why in the world did you spend all? Of that week in church. Literally. Yeah. During Holy Week and Easter <laughs> uh, with the bunnies. I don't get it. Oh, not, like, no bunnies. You know, you want to be able to respond. You don't want it to be like, hold on, let me look down. Uh, like, right. That's a question. Right. That's a question <laughs> just for the pastor or something, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah so you're like, you're all right. There's more, there's more than just because of the zombie apocalypse. Like, yeah. more reasons to internalize yeah. our theology. Yeah, there are that. living people we want to talk about, too, so... Talk yeah. to and, and mm-hmm. have it be a natural thing instead of a stilted, I can look that up and recite off the page if I need to. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Luther gives a start in that, even if, again, we're not talking about oxes and donkeys so much. 
So, um, so the com- the first commandment. Uh, there are a lot of things I think you know and have oh, heard. Hang on a second. Oh, go ahead. So, is it organized in the same way as the small catechism, as far as like the order of things? So you can sort of track your way through it. It is, with one exception, and that is, well, actually, frankly, it is the same as the small catechism. The fifth part which is confession absolution, sometimes the office of the keys is mixed in there, like in the small catechism. That one has always been kind of an addendum. Again, because mm-hmm. Luther built it over time. It's not that we okay. we didn't believe all of it. He believed it all, but but he wrote the books over time. Mm-hmm. So commandments, creed, Lord's Prayer, that's the, the heart of it, right? Okay. And you want to talk about the sacraments, so that, you know, but he usually talked about baptism and the Lord's Supper first, and mm-hmm. then he also wanted to have something in confession, so that kind of got tied in. In the large catechism, that part on confession had sometimes been left out. Mm-hmm. It's called the exhortation to mm-hmm. a confession. In fact, mm-hmm. it's not in my book of Concord. It is in the new catechism, if you dare mm-hmm. to read it. Uh, and uh, it's one of my favorite parts, frankly, of the large catechism. So It's mm-hmm. very good. I don't want it to be left out at all. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, anyway, so I guess your fifth part becomes your sixth part, usually in the large catechism. Okay. So, But they're okay. all na- labeled the same. Commandments, okay. creed, okay. Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Okay, so carry on. First commandment. Oh, the first commandment is, I mean, the whole thing's great, but this, you've you've heard it explained to you, right, that the first commandment kind of is like the, it pervades all of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Luther mm-hmm. explains that in greater detail here, right? So mm-hmm. really, every time you've heard a pastor express that in a sermon or, or you've said that, uh, you've picked up on that in the small catechism too, Luther explains it at length here. But he also gives this great definition of, of what is a God. And I think this is interesting. Uh, you shall have no other God. What does this mean? It means you shall have me alone as your God. What is the meaning of this and how is it to be understood? What does it mean to have a God or what is a God? Answer, a God means that from which we are to expect all good and in which we are to take refuge in all distress. To have a God is nothing other than trusting and believing him with your heart. And then he says this kind of interesting phrase, uh, I've often said that the confidence and faith of the heart alone make God or make both God and an idol. Same difference. So, so this idea that a God is more than just uh, a deity in the strict sense of the word, like with a name, mm. Anubis, Ra, uh, Allah, uh, the Holy Trinity, right? But it is we turn everything into gods or we construct mm-hmm. idols out of all sorts of stuff, not just literally carving statues of wood and stone and giving them some cool name, mm-hmm. but also – you know, we turn these things into the sources of our life. We, in, in the same way that the Bible describes in a very silly and mocking way how the guy cuts down a tree, half of it he throws in the fire to, you know, warm his house, and the other half he carves into an idol and bows down to it, which is really silly. <laughs> it's just as silly when we, you know, fret and, uh, and crimp and save and, and really bow down to and worship money. Right? Mm. I mean, there are hymns about mm. that in the secular world <laughs> that are pretty good hymns uh, <laughs> about how we bow down toward our money and we worship it and uh, it, it controls us. They've gotten this commandment just fine, at least in that, as regards that, right? At least mm. the condemning part of it, not knowing who the real God is. Yeah, I do, I do appreciate that because, you know, with all the commandments, there's the easy version and there's the hard version. Yeah, Matthew as 5, you've I, heard it said— do not murder. Right. I tell you. <laughs> the easier version is you shall have no other gods. Well, I've done that. I've never once gotten myself an idol <laughs> and in any way offered incense or bull's blood or anything to it. Yeah. So I'm good. Done. I've kept this commandment my whole life. You know, fifth commandment, you shall not kill. I have never actually literally stabbed someone in the heart. So I'm good, right? Let me into heaven right now. And yet Luther does a wonderful job in the small catechism, and I imagine just as good a job in the large catechism of of doing just as Jesus says in Matthew 5. Yeah, you've heard it said, but I say to you, you have not considered the full meaning of this commandment if you think you have kept it. Mm. My, my husband likes to point out when he's talking about fear, love, and trust in God above all things, explanation to the first commandment in the small catechism. If you're afraid of anything more than you're afraid of God, you've broken the first commandment. Yes. Oh, shoot. I'm an anxious person. That's not comforting, but there you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. Luther elaborates a lot on that fear. So, mm-hmm. 
I don't want to do. All I knew Ken got it from somewhere. Yeah, I don't want to do all the commandments. I mean, I think it's a big chunk of it, just like it is in our catechism instruction. And and the funny thing is, I think ten years ago I would have said we need to just lighten up on the commandments. We end up doing those really hard, and we run out of time to do the rest of the catechism before confirmation. Uh, yeah, you know, like I, I the still, American Revolution and Civil War. Yes, exactly. I don't colonial know era. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> By the time we get to Eisenhower, it's like, oh, well, it's June. We'll touch on that some other time. I know everything about colonial America, but like nothing after about, I don't know, 1850. <laughs> I, I still believe that, like you say, for the curriculum. But the hard part is, you know, in many ways, the the morals, you know, the, the what is right and what is wrong is a genuine problem of our time. Mm. You know, I, I certainly yes. have years in college that— they literally, it was the idea that you would be chaste until, uh, I mean, until and in marriage was a different idea that they were not familiar with. Mm-hmm. That, that was mm-hmm. never presented to them as any kind of normal. You know, in a way, some of this basic stuff that seems basic to us is, is no longer to be assumed anymore. It probably shouldn't have been assumed before either. So I don't know if that means we have to take more time on it, but I, I think we just have to be a little more nuts and bolts explaining about it, uh, mm. it that, mm-hmm. and, and that goes for all the commandments so mm-hmm. if you don't get the commandments if you don't understand that you're a sinner all that stuff in the creed and the lord's prayer and all the rest of it it doesn't mean anything yeah. it's just well of course of course jesus died for me of course jesus loves me i'm lovable <laughs> yeah well and i think that's only half of it too is and, and maybe that's what Luther has freedom and time to go into in more depth with. It's not just here's all of the things that make you sinners about these commandments. That's all there, of course. But it's also, you know, what does this commandment teach we ought to do? What What is the mm. right thing? What is yeah. what is the good thing that's being broken by violating this commandment? That's, mm. that's brought out much more because he has more time in the large catechism. And I think that's the part that um, – Yes, people. It's it's not hard once you've been hearing the word of God to come to the conclusion that I need I need a savior, um, mm. or it shouldn't be at least if the Holy Spirit is at work and and He is in His Word. I think at first blush, now it's what is the right thing that is astounding to other people and is news to them. So, uh, but we also mm. have that taught well here. Yeah. All right. Third commandment. Third commandment. Uh, there's a lot that's really good in here, but this will help explain why, if anyone remembers, the old translation was sanctify the holy day. Yeah. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Luther does a good job of going into that. I don't know if he ever mentions it. My favorite Bible passage for teaching this is Exodus 31, 13, where it's one of the places where the Lord explains what the third commandment is. But he says in this instance, you know, sancti- uh, you'll keep my Sabbaths. Uh, so that it, you may know and do no work, rest on the seventh day, so that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Hmm. The understand being hmm. you need to do nothing. Stop doing the work so that you will realize I'm the one who does the work in you to make you holy. Oh. Right? So that's in the Bible. I don't think Luther actually quotes it. Uh, <laughs> but he obviously was thinking about it because he he talks at length about this this. Resting connected with mm. the holy part and and the the holiday, he's he's really pulling on that, right? Why do you have holidays? Uh, and remember, he's living in a very Christianized place as opposed to where we are. Holidays are not mm-hmm. just vacations to binge Netflix. Holidays <laughs> are <laughs> catch up on the Mandalorian. I admit it. Uh, holidays are their holy days, right? To hear the word of God, to to be sanctified. Um, and it's not about we need to make God holy or we need to make the day holy by the things we do. It's about God is making us holy by these matters. So, mm. so he says that. He also just has a great line in paragraph 91. God's word is the true holy thing above all holy things. It's the only one we Christians know and have. Uh, and uh, so he's also kind of rebuking the, the medieval Roman Catholic teaching he was dealing with about <laughs> saints relics and mm. special times and, you know, kind of almost this magical understanding of holiness. We ought to have a little more, we, we ought to believe that the word of God is a little more magical than we we give it uh, <laughs> credit for, I think, um, and, mm-hmm. and take it seriously that we hear and learn it. Uh, that is actually how God sanctifies us, First Timothy 4. Mm-hmm. Some great quotes in that third commandment one too. Mm-hmm. Do you want to hear a quote, Rachel? 
I want to hear a quote. Yes. Okay. So this sassy Luther. Likewise, those fussy spirits who are rebuked, who after they have heard a sermon or two, find hearing more sermons to be tedious and dull. They think that they know all that is well and enough and need no more instruction. For that is exactly the sin that was previously counted among mortal sins and is called acadia, i.e. apathy yeah. or satisfaction. This is a malignant, dangerous plague with which the devil bewitches and deceives the hearts of many so that he may surprise us and secretly take God's word from us. Hmm. A.K.A. go to church and learn God's word. Also, that's explaining despise, right? Mm. We would despise preaching in his yeah. word in the small catechism. And despise mm-hmm. is a word that I, like, I would never say that of any of you people. <laughs> like, the only, uh, despise is a word I reserve for, like, the most horrible people ever. I despise them. I hate them. <laughs> Passion of a thousand sons. Mm. But that the despising Luther has in mind and that we are most susceptible to with the word of God is the opposite of that, like caring so little about it that it's just like this. Mm-hmm. I, I could do that later. I could do that any time, uh, but you can't always binge the Mandalorian. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. All right. What do you have next? I, I just love the way he makes the transition. I think Rachel will especially like this, right? From the Ten Commandments into the Creed. And he says, now for something completely different, right? <laughs> so, And it's right at the beginning, but he just says, so far we've heard the first part of the Christian doctrine, Ten Commandments. We've seen all that God wants us to do or mm-hmm. not to do, both. But now there properly follows the Creed, which sets forth to us everything that we must expect and receive from God. Hmm. Uh, so, so the dis, I mean, this kind of basic two arrows understanding of law and gospel, uh, mm-hmm. or this two arrows understanding of, of, yeah, I guess law and gospel is it, is the law is what God says we're to do for Him and for our neighbor, the gospel is what He is doing for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, other people have put it in terms of grammar, right? Who's who's the one who's the subject of the sentence doing the thing? Mm-hmm. In the gospel, it's God who does it, right? In in the law, it's our works. It's what we're doing. Um, so that that idea comes right here in the large catechism, and it's it's quite clear and uh, quite simple. Uh, he doesn't actually spend a whole lot of time in this teaching. He doesn't go on and on about the Trinity, which certainly he could have. Uh, he talks mostly about creation and, and what it means to have a father. Uh, he just gives a brief summary of God's work for us uh, on Jesus. Uh, the part I like most is where he he clarifies this word Lord. Uh, have you guys ever heard anybody say, sure, Jesus is your Savior, but have you is he your Lord? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of dope. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. What does that mean when they ask you that? Um, he isn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're trying, to, they're trying to trouble you. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little condemnatory that you are just mooching off of him for salvation, mm. but not actually submitting to him in obedience and faith. Mm. That's what I hear when I hear someone ask that question. As Cheap to grace, say, right? That phrase. Mm. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's. There's nothing wrong with that. If you feel pricked in your conscience because of that, maybe you ought to consider that and repent. (laughs) Confessions. Oh, I feel prickled in my conscience at all kinds of things. Well, it's it's not wrong to be forgiven for that, but um, but but you're right. I I mean, I think doing it with those words is missing the point. Luther has his own definition of Lord here. I just I remember it vividly when I learned this uh, in high school, and uh, yeah, this is the sum of the article. The little word Lord means the same as Redeemer. It means the one who's bought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, the one who preserves us in the same. Uh, So, I mean, maybe if he's your Savior and not your Lord, you shouldn't look to yourself. You should look to him. (laughs) He's Mm -hmm. the one who's going to preserve himself as your Lord. He's going to preserve you as his servant and as his child that he loves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's there's great stuff in the... uh, in the article on the Holy Spirit, too, uh, but uh, in addition to this definition he has, uh, which some have had some questions about, but that the Holy Christian Church is the communion of saints, that yeah. the communion of saints kind of comments on what Holy Christian Church is. So my pastor told us that, like, right when we were right on his, like, first Bible study or something, he's like, when I say the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, I'm just going to run right through that. Uh, and people have started picking up doing that when we say the creed now, and I chuckle every time. <laughs> Yeah, like 
you know, uh, apposition, so you could say, Holy Christian Church, that is a communion of saints. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's fully on board with this one. <laughs> it's, it is a beautiful understanding. But then also, I just love this sentence, so I'm going to read it. And it's it's there in the small catechism, but it's it's just a little more beautiful here. Everything in the Christian church is ordered toward this goal. Well, I'd like to listen to that. We shall daily receive in the church nothing but the forgiveness of sin through the word and the sacraments to comfort and encourage our consciences as long as we live here. So even though we have sins... The grace of the Holy Spirit does not allow them to harm us, for we are in the Christian church where there is nothing but continuous, uninterrupted forgiveness of sins. This is because God forgives us and because we forgive, bear with, and help one another. I just love that. Uh, he also says, and outside the Christian church, you won't find the gospel of forgiveness of sins or any of that stuff, right? Um, so one, I think it, it encourages us to never lose sight of what is unique this is, this is what's in the Office of the Keys in the small catechism. The peculiar power in the old translation, the special authority in, in our current translation, right? What it means is unique. You don't find the forgiveness of sins outside the Christian church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The flip side is like that's what we treasure most and what we find all over the place in the Christian church. Uh, and I love the way he says not only from God to us, of course, primarily, but also that that ought to have an, if you want to make him your lord <laughs> that ought to also have an effect that we forgive one another right um so essential mm-hmm. i have another spicy luther quote jump but the term resurrection of the flesh used here does not agree with good german wording <clears throat> for when we germans hear the word flesh fleisch we think of nothing more than the butcher block but in good ha. german wording we would say resurrection of the body However, it is not a big issue as long as we understand the words right. <laughs> I love that. He's like, well, you got to be careful with this word flesh because I know what, as soon as I say that, everyone's thinking barbecue. <laughs> Resurrection of the body. It's not like that at all. Their Sunday lunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Words, words change, right? I, I also appreciate just his gentleness. Like, uh, Aaron... I don't want to pick on you, but you say this all the time, right? <laughs> you get a little annoyed when the pastor's complain about they don't like the translation it's mm. all wrong and mm. you know is it it's true so luther has a little rebuke for them <laughs> you can just point to this and you could say guys it's not a big issue as long as we understand it right just yeah teach us what it means it's not a big deal <laughs> calm down <laughs> not a large catechism adam <laughs> i love it what else you got? You you have all of these little sticky notes in your book right now, and they're all color coded. I'm assuming. No, no, no. Oh, not that good. So, sad. I'm gonna pretend uh, they're color coded. <laughs> baptism's great, by the way. If you uh, uh, hopefully you've talked a lot about infant baptism, but that is a question that Lutherans in particular seem to have to. We have to be the ones who stand up. Yeah. Mm. of infant baptism. Yeah. Where are Catholic Often. friends? Come on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Luther has a whole big discussion of it and an explanation of it. So this is probably the best place to to find that. I, you know, I hope that you can explain from the words that we have in the small catechism why it makes sense to baptize babies. But Luther takes the time to kind of defend that very point. So mm-hmm. just, just read that. Uh, uh, you'll enjoy it. I also like that he draws on an old uh, conversation. If you have the full medieval background to this, which you might not, uh, <laughs> you know, they talk about kind of like the idea that baptism is the ship of salvation. We still have this in mm-hmm. one of our prayers, right? The uh, Ark of Salvation mm-hmm. yeah, at baptism. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, and think about the Easter Vigil not mm-hmm. too long ago, right? Uh, you might have heard so about that. Good. But uh, the, the medieval teaching was sometimes described as like, that's the ship, but sometimes once you sin, once you sin after baptism, you kind of wreck that ship, right? And now you've mm-hmm. got a like if if you're in a shipwreck, you've got to find some kind of piece of wood to hold on to and float, oh, right? Okay. So you got to find something else. Well, the other planks are, I mean, this is why you have to keep collecting all seven throughout the rest of your life. All the oh all yes, the Catholic Church Those, to kind of grab, sacraments. Grab as many planks as you can. To, so you're building to be a, saved. a life raft. I guess build your own. <laughs> yeah. That's yes. depressing. Hmm. Luther says it this way, and, and I think this explains why, at least in the first version, he didn't include that confession part. Because Luther really always saw it as just like continuing to return to baptism. Mm. So he says, uh, 
we don't want to fall into that opinion we were stuck in for a long time, imagining that our baptism is something past, which we can no longer use after we've fallen again to sin. The reason for this is that baptism is regarded as only based on the outward act once performed and then completed. And that arose from the fact that St. Jerome said that repentance is the second plank by which we have to swim forward and cross over the water after the ship has been broken apart. By this teaching, baptism has been abolished so that it no longer has any use to us. That's not right. The ship of baptism never breaks because, as we said, it's God's ordinance and not our work. Mm-hmm. Uh, First Peter, he quotes. Uh, but it, uh, it does happen, indeed, that we slip and fall out of the ship. Uh, <laughs> But if anyone falls out, what do you think you should do? Swim up, cling to the ship until uh, you come back out and get back in it, right? Get back in the boat is what he says. Baptism doesn't doesn't get dashed. You just have to be brought back to it. And and essentially, that's our understanding of repentance. It's, you know, in its particular, it's the reason that we have forgiveness of sins spoken all the time. The reason for confession absolution considered narrowly or generally is is just to return to baptism, jump right back onto the ship, right? To return, to, I mean, God has never left. God has never abandoned his promises. Maybe we've fallen away from him. Mm-hmm. Come on back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you would say that. I just wrote an article on clinging to the ship in stormy waters. <gasps> literally called That's Don't Give Up the Ship. <laughs> Did you quote the large catechism? <laughs> I did. No, I quoted the flood prayer. (gasps) Yes. Missed opportunity. Sorry. I hadn't read the large catechism then yet, but you're right. I should have. I mean, the flood prayer is great, too. I do like it. (laughs) Oh, his stuff on the sacraments really good, too. Um, I mean, I think he gets both aspects of uh, we want to make sure you understand what it is in the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, just preached a sermon on this on Holy Thursday, and I didn't realize how much of what I said was kind of imitating what Luther said, so. Nice job. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe I should read this more, too. (laughs) Or maybe it's just that it's God's truth, and he said it, and then you said it. Let's go with that one. (laughs) (laughs) But, okay, so he says, like, uh, our faith doesn't make the sacrament what it is. The Word does this. Christ Mm. doesn't say, if you believe or you're worthy, then you receive my body and blood. No, he says, take and eat. This is my body and blood. Do this. Uh, it's like saying no matter whether you're worthy or underworthy, here you get his body and blood by virtue of the fact that I've spoken it, right? Mm-hmm. So, But that's only the first part of it, right? That's that's what is it we're eating and drinking. It's his body and blood. We also want to know, like, why do we have it? What's it for? Uh, what's the purpose? Who ought to receive it? Mm-hmm. And Luther, uh, you know, really uh, explains very pastorally, uh, uh, but but very sharply, I think, you know, who ought to have the Lord's Supper and who ought not to have the Lord's Supper. Mm. And in this way, I, I think this is an excellent, uh, I think the, the large catechism on the Lord's Supper is especially good to read as a way of preparing ourselves to, to rightly receive the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. That's really helpful that he did that because I know a lot of individuals and in churches really struggle with that question who ought and who ought not yeah he doesn't talk now so I'm much s- about maybe the so there are kind of two aspects of closed communion mm-hmm. that should probably be okay. one of these shouldn't it yeah let's oh. just jump in someday hey wow. time All right. closed communion so he doesn't talk so much about the one that i think a lot of people are hung up on which is that people of differing confessions including different christian confessions uh don't shouldn't eat the lord's supper together uh, but he does talk a lot about why it isn't just no harm, no foul, you all belly up to the bar if you feel like it. Hmm. Uh, that, in fact, even somebody who is a member in good standing of your congregation uh, might not be in good standing hmm. for the Lord's Supper. I mean, that that's actually at the heart of what we hmm. mean by good standing is not like uh, I paid my dues or something hmm. or, uh, or the pastor knows my name. It's about, you know, do you believe this is for the forgiveness of sins? What must mm-hmm. that mean about you then? Mm-hmm. Do you understand that? Are, are you coming for the right reasons? Do you are you coming understanding this is the body of Christ? You know that's why it takes such time to explain that. So, mm. so yeah, I think it's it's very good for. I'm going to assume you're a member of your own church, uh, uh, and you know what mm-hmm. confession and what altar you're attending. But still, for our consciences, right? For examining our conscience, uh, this is a, a great way to do it. So. Mm-hmm. I love this quote. I've I've had conversations with people about like 
what if I don't feel worthy of going mm-hmm. to receive the sacrament? Like that comes up a lot. I love this. Such people must learn that it is the highest art to know that our sacrament does not depend upon our worthiness. We are not baptized because we are worthy and holy, nor do we go to confession because we are pure and without sin. On the contrary, we go because we are poor, miserable people. We go exactly because we are unworthy. This is true unless we are talking about someone who desires no grace and absolution nor intends to change. Can we, can we get a 20-foot pole again? <laughs> sure, 20-foot pole. So I saw a tweet uh, <laughs> oh, no. of one of the annotated arguments <laughs> uh, quoting another pastor. I'll leave him nameless, but you can get the book if you want and find out. <laughs> Uh, who had a statement where he said the only people, basically, it's not the worthy that go to the sacrament. It's it's those who are unworthy who are truly worthy for the sacrament. Okay? I- I've said this as well. Okay. Absolutely paraphrasing and commenting on this sentence from Luther that you've quoted, right? Uh-huh. And the point is not, the, the point of Luther, especially if you have the large, the whole thing, so you can see the context instead of just the isolation, mm-hmm. is not talking about, you know, you should, the, the more sinful you are, the better you'll appreciate, you know, the gospel or something. <laughs> right. But, Wrong lesson. Yeah, you should, <laughs> uh, I mean, Paul talks, he actually says this little thing, should we sin more so that grace will abound? Heck, know it all. By no means. Mm-hmm. Mega noito. <laughs> all my kids know that phrase. Heck, know it all. So, yeah, I think what Luther says is very clear, right? It's it's not the knowledge and pleasure of your sins. No. It's the knowledge and grief and terror. And, and mm-hmm. I want to be, I'm sick and tired of these things. I, I want to. I want to escape them. And that also drives people to, to stay away from the sacrament. It drives people to stay away from God, from church, mm-hmm. from, from their yeah. friends. Have mm-hmm. you, yeah. You've noticed that too? Like I've talked to people who have said, oh, I can't go back to church right now because I'm dealing with all this messy stuff in my life. Once I get it all sorted out, then I can go back to church. And I just... It's what the church my heart for. sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, they're right and they're wrong. I mean, uh, you know... It's not a good idea. It says this all over the place in the scriptures. It's not a good idea for a sinner to go up to a holy God. That doesn't end right. well. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, there's a reason there's a tabernacle in the Old Testament. There's a reason the Son of God has to die uh, under the wrath of God, right? Mm. But, uh, I mean, you said, someone said before about fearing God, right? That he's the one mm-hmm. we should be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet he's the one who's always telling us himself, do not be afraid, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so the one who we ought to fear above all else is the one who then says, "You're, you know, fear not. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You're mine, uh, and therefore we have no fear of anybody." Right? I mean, uh, right. So, so they're right to say, you know, there's no way I can approach God. That's right. Except, well, almost right. There is a way you can approach God. His name is Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, his blood uh, is shed for your forgiveness. Um, in fact, here he's giving it, right? So mm-hmm. so that's the right understanding, right, of both repentance and faith, of both the law and the gospel that ultimately is trying to lead us all to the sacrament. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I don't think there's probably a better way to say it other than God actually does want everybody to go to the Lord's Supper. Mm. He wants them to go rightly and making a faithful and united confession with their mm. with their yeah. peers. So yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We'll we'll get to know that you are unworthy. But to desire it so strongly that you will creep up on your knees, hands outstretched anyway. Yeah, and Luther's obviously not convinced that that's going to lead you to a life of of never tr- improving, right? Yeah. So. Right. Yep. Yeah. All right. We don't have much time probably, but I do want to just say you have to read this exhortation to confession. Because I, I usually okay. like to ask people, like, show of hands, hard to do on the radio, <laughs> <laughs> hard to do on a podcast, uh, <laughs> show of hands how many of you have go on to confession with your pastor. Okay, I assume maybe none of you raised hands out there in podcast land. So, you know, it, when you're married to a pastor, it's awkward because who are you going to go to confession to? Your husband or not your husband? Yeah. Either way, a it's a little it's a little strange. It's a different question. The short answer is I think you should go to whoever he goes to. So, Oh. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a great plan. Yeah. Thank you. I always wondered about how to how to manage that. And, and you might you might lay a little uh, uh, prick on his conscience if you ask him. So who do you go to? I just want to. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. People, but of course, then the next question will be: Your sins are not hidden. You, you think you need 
private confession and absolution. What did you do, woman? Uh, yes, you can't use that to uh, mm. he, yeah, heap, uh, heap coals on it. <laughs> That's not what James meant. Mm. Okay, anyway, so if you've never gone, Luther tells you you should go, so you should probably read what he has to say. But uh, the best quote here is just, he says, when I ask you to go to confession, or when I urge you, I think it actually is, I'm just asking you to be a Christian. Mm. Which is fantastic in a number of ways. One, I think it's a little guilty. It's a little bit of a guilt trip, maybe. Like this is this is not strange. And are you a Christian? Then I think you'll want to go to confession. But I mean, that's his point: is it shouldn't be a big deal. It shouldn't be a, a oh, I saw his car out in front of the church at confession time. He must be a real baddie. Uh, or asking your husband, you know, what's the name of your father confessor, implies that he must be a real bad guy who has to go all the time. Or this, this is what Christians, this is what their life is all about. I need the forgiveness of sins. I, I know my sins. I need forgiveness. I want to I wanna grow in good works, and, and I want to have the, the power from Christ Jesus and his blood to do that. That's why I'm happy to hear that uh, in this Christian church, everything's ordered to this goal, that we receive nothing but the forgiveness of sins all the time in all these different ways, right? So, uh, you know, the Christian life is one of repentance, of, of turning away from our sins, of recognizing them constantly. In fact, especially when, you know, we've been trying really hard to not do that thing. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and, and not to despair, but to seek the forgiveness of sins, right? Not to, not to freak out when somebody does something wrong, but to seek that they would know the forgiveness of sins too. I mean, this, do, this clearly does not happen outside the church. In, in the world we have where, one, you're expected to put everything on the internet for everyone to read, mm. and two, you're also supposed to somehow survive that <laughs> and, and not have ever said anything wrong. I mean, this is a really dangerous podcast, right? <laughs> um, it, it would be impossible to do if it weren't for we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think that, that would be a good solution to any uh, debacles or controversies we may have had recently is to <laughs> seek the forgiveness of sins reigning in our church. Mm. Uh, and I, I really do. Uh, I mean, I'm a, a student posthumously of Ken Corby, uh, who was a great preacher and teacher of confession absolution uh, and uh, individual confession absolution, in fact. And uh, I am convinced he's right that this is this is the secret. This is the secret sauce, the key to revitalizing the church is individual confession absolution. Mm. I, I just think that's that's the most obvious, like the most obvious person to talk to, as you guys have obviously realized, is the pastor. He's probably, like every Christian ought to be able to say something comforting and true about the scriptures to me. Mm. Hopefully if they're reading the large catechism, they'll know even more. But the pastor has a job to do it, so you know mm-hmm. he ought to do it at least. But the same is true for forgiveness, right? I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that if I went to just my buddy or my even my wife or even my kids, especially my kids maybe, <laughs> I wouldn't expect them to forgive me if I admitted I did something wrong. I, who knows what they would say? Maybe they would castigate me for it. Maybe they'd say, I knew it. you know, Or it's about time you, you figured it out. Who knows what would happen, right? Uh, no, they're much more pious than that. But um, <laughs> if I go to the pastor, I expect to hear the truth, right? And uh, and the great thing is we have even we have it on record that Jesus made his his apostles like he said this is what you have to do because I rose from the dead right everyone's sins you forgive they're forgiven right mm. um, so it's got to go that way so that's ob- that's the obvious starting place that the devil is hid from us that that we should just be able to go to the guy who's there who's sent to us to preach the gospel and he would tell us oh oh that sin. That sin that you committed is forgiven. That Jesus' blood. Okay. You're, you're forgiven. We are, as Sarah, add per, personal uh, one-on-one confession and absolution to our list of things to talk about with Chaplain Denzer <laughs> some other time. Because my first question is, my pastor is already badly overworked. Do you mean he wants to see me and all my family members and every other member of our church one-on-one for confession and absolution? Knowing that he would never sleep if that were the case. I, I dare you. It hasn't, hap- it hasn't happened. Lately. <laughs> it hasn't happened to any pastor lately that he was so busy with confession that he missed anything. 
Mm. I dare you. I make that a problem. Make that a problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll have to revisit this because this would be a great, great subject. But I mean, what, what I don't want to lose is once, once that's happening, I mean, I am just very convinced that forgiven sinners are going to learn best then how to forgive one another in their marriages, mm. yeah. in their families. Uh, fathers to children and children to fathers and and uh, maybe even co-workers and bosses mm. and uh, and maybe even we'll discover a little bit of how to how to forgive a world that doesn't know they need forgiveness or doesn't <laughs> know it's possible but might actually mm. really be excited to find out there's a way to live down the things I've done and said on the internet and in my life and <laughs> mm-hmm. and I don't actually have to carry this albatross on my back the rest of my life mm-hmm the internet is forever, but so is forgiveness. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love oh. it. I love a good Coleridge reference. Thank you for that. <laughs> On that note, we got to wrap it up. It has been well over an hour. So thanks for joining us again in the Ladies Lounge, Chaplain Denzer. You're welcome. It's been fun. I'm sure we'll have yes. a hot topic for you again next time. I think uh, close communion or too. <laughs> private confession absolution. I think one of those are going to be great. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> How can people connect with Chaplain Denzer? Are there places where you can follow him? You can find uh, the resources that we put at lcms.org slash worship. Uh, if you want to tune in and see what you're missing at Daily Chapel or just oh, yeah. spy on us, I, I mean, I think it's good that the church can spy on what we're doing here. We have Daily Chapel every day at 10 a.m. You can listen on KFUO. You can watch it on the LCMS Facebook page. Yeah. Cool. And we'll also share links in the show notes. We'll share those links, but we'll also share links for how you can find the large catechism, the free resource online that you don't even have to buy. You can just go to the internet and read stuff. Awesome. And and also where you can purchase your own large catechism, whatever variety you would like to buy. There's several different ways you can do it from CPH. So we'll, we'll include those links in the show notes. You can join our community on Facebook and we can talk about this some more if you want to. Lutheran Ladies Lounge on Facebook, or you can follow us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. And if you tag us, we'll share your content into our stories as well. You can find all of our podcasts at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. KFUO Radio and the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast are underwritten in part by Wicking Vicar. Visit them online at wickingvicar.com. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org give.